All right, guys, what a pleasure have I got for you today. I don't know if the internet can handle so much fabulousness. I don't know if the <laughs> zeros and ones can capture all the good looks that are taking place right now. Oh, I've got, stop it. Stop <laughs> I've got it. Milo Yanopoulos <laughs> with us right here. How are you doing, Milo? I'm very well. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, thank you for being on. Uh, so I thought what we would do today, I mean, there are so many things that we'd like to cover and a lot of people have written in to say, oh, please ask him about this and so on. So I thought what we'd start with is sort of go over some of the key folks that you typically criticize and then see if there is any, I mean, is there a theme in terms of the the typical targets that you go after? Is it that you're going after shoddy reasoning and so on? So I thought we would start with maybe the most recent thing that you've put out, which is a uh, critique of uh, our good friend, <laughs> Mr. Science Guy, Mr. Bowtie. I was about to wear a bow tie, by the way, for you and didn't. Oh, well, I don't I... even own one, I don't think. I have one for my black tie. I don't think I have a regular bow tie oh, because, of course, you. nobody wears them because they're ridiculous. <laughs> so why don't, we, why don't we start with Dan? I think we could then tie it. You had, as part of that series, you also uh, critiqued Tyson and other uh, sort of communicative mm -hmm. science. So why don't we start with that and then we can see where it goes. Sure thing. Uh, yeah, so I mean, one of the things that always entertains me about um, people in the public eye professing to explain science or explain any discipline it, are the sorts of political um, forces that begin to act on them when they enter the public sphere, when they get purchased in the media, when they get a book deal or a TV show, and particularly when they start to make friends. When they start to make friends who expect them to have a certain set of opinions and also expect them to communicate their ideas in particular language. And I discovered that um, in particular, scientists have a problem with this. And they have a problem when they enter into the public arena and start off as perfectly, in some cases, perfectly respectable um, communicators and researchers of, of um, whether it's astrophysics or engineering or whatever. Once they start to get very popular, they seem to all cleave in one political direction. And it's a political, you know, and it's a, to a sort of, a, a sort of um, ten commandments of progressive liberalism that um, is quite often not entirely in keeping with the scientific method, very often not at all in keeping with um, basic sort of principles of academic integrity, and uh, sort of entertainingly homogenous in the, way, in the place that all these people end up in order to survive. And it tells you something interesting about the biases in the media when a scientist can't really be a very popular scientist unless he signs up to a particular board of uh, sort of a chalkboard of ideas so to I, I for the series that i do at breitbart there's only two episodes so far um i say episodes i mean columns it's it's a written series um uh, scientists who are actually really stupid and the first installment was neil degrasse tyson um who i think is is you know <laughs> i always thought he was the best example of this but then everyone was saying no you should have started with bill nye um so i've done bill nye as well and i know that you will probably have some things to say about yes. him yes um <laughs> but yeah and I, I intend to continue this series and investigate the um what, what these people all have in common is a sort of um I won't go as far as, is it a selling out? I suppose it is. Um, it's a sort of compromise of what you would usually consider to be princ to prin principles of open-minded scientific inquiry and free exchange of ideas. Right. When they start to become famous, they start to use language like, you have to believe this or else, in right, the case right. of Bill Nye. Or in the case of Neil deGrasse Tyson, he starts ridiculing and demeaning his ideological opponents, which right, is, right. you know, for somebody who is supposed to be um, a sort of flagship figure in culture for the um, for the open exchange of ideas and for the scientific you know inquiry for, for open inquiry into the world around us you know for the sort of humility and um, and open mindedness that we I think expect from our scientific figureheads and from science. It sort of leaves, I think it leaves the public wondering, well, if these are the guys that are famous, how much worse are the guys in universities? <laughs> so, so let me interject. Uh, I mean, uh, you, you mentioned a word that I very much like, and humility, right? So there's this idea of 
uh, epistemological humility. I think Peter Bogosian, a friend of mine, a philosopher, uh, mentioned it recently in our conversation. But it's an idea that goes back to, I think, Confucius, right? The idea of knowing what you, do, you know and what you don't know, and that's ultimately knowledge, right? So uh, real practicing scientists are actually incredibly, f I mean, they're filled with doubt, right? Because they are absolutely aware, they're calibrated about the things that they know. And when they know something, they know the boundary conditions that allows them to say, this is true, but that's the boundary to which I'm willing to go in terms of supporting that idea. So they're actually quite humble in terms of their epistemological outlook. I think what happens with guys like uh, Tyson and uh, and the science guy, by, by the way, the science guy, not to denigrate him, uh, I mean, he's not a scientist, right? I mean, he's He's, he's a guy who, I mean, who popularized science, right? And that's great. I mean, he does a wonderful job at it. But I think what happens is that they succumb to a, a lack of epistemological humility because they get so much attention, so they no longer can calibrate uh, what they know and what they don't know. What do you think of that? I think it's probably true. And certainly the scientists that I know, whether it's researchers, the people who are, who are you know, actively in universities, they very often talk about just how radically unsound scientific knowledge can be sometimes. They took the half-life of facts, you know, right. things that we thought we knew just half a decade ago, right. you know, right. to, uh, aren't true anymore. You know, there, and there are huge changes in our understanding of the way that the world around us works, so the way that different elements in that world interact with one another, and our basic understanding of matter and physics, and, and you know, the, the, uh, there are all sorts of things that we thought we knew 10 years ago that aren't true anymore. And it's that sort of, it's the arrogance and certainty and dismissiveness. And sometimes it can come across a sort of almost bullying, patronizing right. smugness right. Right. Um, from these people, which to me seems profoundly antithetical to the whole purpose of doing science and doing any kind of study, actually. Right. You know, trying to find out what you don't know is the whole reason that anybody interested in letters or numbers or, you know, processes or anything in the world around us is engaged in. That's what we're trying to do. We're trying to find out the most information we can, synthesize it through a variety of different, um, you know, with a variety of different sort of uh, methods of interrogation, look at it through a few different prisms and lenses to see if that throws up any, you know, any more, um, you know, illuminating insights, and then try to come to some kind of, um, some kind of, uh, of, of happy, temporary uh, coalition between the, of, of the various different right. data this is not what um, famous public scientists, like public intellectuals, do, uh, because their because their media their media career relies on them oversimplifying to the point of uh, parody, yeah. and to a great degree, their professional success and their financial success relies on them having the right opinions. Right. Because if they don't have the right opinions about things, they don't get books commissioned and they don't get TV series. And all of these things, these are some of the reasons why, you know, I think these guys, they're rich, famous, you know, successful celebrities. I think they can cope with a bit of teasing and I think they can cope with a bit of questioning from someone like me because they deserve to have, you know, they deserve to be reminded, I think, that intellectual humility is the cornerstone of any sincere intellectual inquiry and any discussion of you know of, of, of with any integrity or sincerity or any uh, you know any uh, uh, claim to um, seriousness right. that intellectual humility has got to be the cornerstone it's got to be the foundation on which everything else is built and they don't have it yeah i hear you you know you they're... mentioned you mentioned that you you characterize them as celebrities there's actually you may not know this there's a bibliometric uh, measure that's come out called the Kardashian Index. Are you familiar what? with it? No, I don't. Oh, this so, sounds amazing. <laughs> so the Kardashian Index is actually a measure of uh, a scientist's, uh, if you like, influence in academia mm -hmm. a as a ratio or a in relation to his fame in terms of his public outreach. So, of course, the ideal guy would be one who has the... Uh, public outreach of Tyson, but yeah. also has the, you know, the scientific influence of, uh, influence, yeah. you know, right? Now, of course, what happens with someone like Tyson, he actually scores extraordinarily, <laughs> right? Uh, he, he does he does absolutely no science, uh, but he, of course, is, you know, profoundly famous. Uh, and so, so I think that the sweet spot is to always uh, have your foot in the door of science. Absolutely. So who's an example of somebody who gets it right? Would that be perhaps Stephen Hawking? Stephen Hawking, perhaps. Uh, Maybe that's a I better mean, balance. I mean, Richard Dawkins is no longer doing much science. Certainly, I think, I don't think in the last 15 years or so. Early, 20 years 
You know exactly. I mean? 20 yeah. years ago, if we probably, if we had Twitter and these types of social metric measures, uh, I think he would have been somebody who was practicing, who was doing, uh, you know, serious science and who was doing outreach. Uh, mm -hmm. So the second thing I want to mention to go back to, to Bill Nye, I mean, w the reason why I sort of took him on you know, it's not, you know, I never attack the person. My, my goal is not to sort of troll him. I don't know Bill Nye. I'm, I'm sure that he's a lovely guy. There's actually a, a get together in California in a, in a few weeks uh, where I was uh, potentially going to be heading to, but it doesn't fit my schedule where he would have been there. And so I received a, an email from someone saying, hey, heads up, you might have to meet Bill Nye face to face. Oh, but in any case, the reason why I went after him is because when, when he, I, I didn't really know much about him until I saw him on a HuffPost live uh, interview where he came up with just a hallucinatory, delusional, uh, causal explanation for how the, the Paris terrorist attack and more generally the, the strife in the Middle East is linked to climate change. <laughs> oh, God. Right? And, and, oh, oh God. And, and you should see how some of these climate trolls came after me because what they were thinking, what they thought I was saying is that I was questioning... Uh, you know, whether climate change is happening or not. And that's not the boom, yeah. right. But, you know, when it comes to Occam's razor and how parsimonious an explanation is for a given phenomenon. <laughs> You've got know, to go some, haven't you? <laughs> I, mean, <laughs> you got... I mean, drought, the drought is not really the main thing that served as the multiplier effect in the Middle East. Uh, so that to me is problematic because you, you know, you put out such a narrative and then you get a bunch of folks who buy into that narrative and then it becomes, it, 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 if you like, it clouds the real mechanisms at play, which deal with religion and, and totalitarian ideologies and so on. So that's why I got upset, right? It, it wasn't because, you know, I don't, I, I'm, I'm not busy enough in my day that I feel like just trolling Bill Nye, right? So. <laughs> you got nothing better to do. Exactly. But this is so. As a journalist, we you know part of our job is looking for patterns and spotting trends. And when I see somebody who is supposedly a sort of neutral popularizer of science and the scientific method, echoing comments that sound crazy to me, um, that I've heard in the mouth of say Bernie Sanders, right. whom I, I do not take terrifically seriously on geopolitical issues right. um, and these two people are both saying the same thing and I'm thinking well this scientist has sort of got form on this you know of sort of having the correct received opinions and they're both saying it in the same way with the you know both seemingly wanting to get at the same people look at the sort of ideological overtones the sort of um, look at the look at the red threads that run through a lot of um, Neil deGrasse Tyson's most provocative public statements and you'll find that many of them are directed at humiliating and ridiculing social conservatives right. um, ridiculing Republicans you know his his famous um, Christmas Day tweet was it you know sort of like today we celebrate the birth of somebody who changed the world Newton oh, like yeah right. yeah yeah ha, 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 ha. except no he was born in January um, you know he can't is, even that, get, is that true actually is he, is he well you adjust for the calendar yeah okay. I mean he was born in January um, you know he can't even get the basic facts on his uh, you know on his smarmy snide smug you know unpleasant ridicule you know and it, and it's like I kind of understand because I too as a journalist being a little bit I can occasionally be tone deaf to feel, uh, you know, I'm, I'm very against the sort of um, uh, the, the um, uh, social justice brigade, all of their sort of grievance mongering and victimhood politics. I don't really, I don't have much truck with offense taking. So I can sometimes be a little tone deaf, you know, I can sometimes say things, you know, as anyone who follows my Twitter feed. No. I, I know, it's hard it. to believe, right? <laughs> but I can occasionally come out with things that some people may find offensive or insensitive or perhaps too soon, as they say. Um... But it takes a special kind of, and I, don't, I can't use any of the words I want to use with you, but um, it takes a special kind of schmuck, let's go with that, um, you know, to come out on Christmas You're Day. You're appropriating a just, Jewish word, by the way, that's racist. No, 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 no. I'm, I'm a member of the family, darling. Oh, that's I'm true. Member... Now, how come your mother is Jewish and you consider yourself Roman Catholic? How did that happen? Well, because my grandmother brought me up Catholic. Ah, gotcha, uh, okay. So yeah, yeah. So it's okay. We're fine. Um, no appropriate, no cultural appropriation here. Uh, so, well, well, I lost my thread. Um, no, it takes a special sort of schmuck to like on Christmas Day just decide that of all of the things that are going on in your life that day, right. one of your parents online and have a go at Christians on right. Christmas Day or whenever close to Christmas Day, right. you know. And I just thought, hmm. 
that something is going on here, and what's going on here is not the neutral, uh, entertaining popularization of science. Right. right. Let's go after maybe your bête noire, your top nemesis, even more than Tyson and uh, oh, and, and, and Nye. I don't Femi even know what that is. Fe feminist, oh. no? Let's talk about feminist. But feminist, but my God. But before you do that, let me sort of mention to you uh, you know, some of my own uh, trials and tribulations with, with this general topic. So as you may or may not know, I, I apply evolutionary psychology in the behavioral sciences and specifically in consumer behavior. And of course, as a evolutionary psychologist, uh, one, you know, one of the things that of course I take for granted as any sane person would is that there are evolved sex differences between the two sexes. As a matter of fact, homo sapiens are defined as a sexually dimorphic species, meaning that there are built-in differences between the two sexes. Now, yes. you may or may not know this, uh, but within the social sciences, uh, this has historically been a profoundly her heretical statement, right? Yes. Uh, everything short of your genitalia is a social construction, and therefore to propose that anything is due to some biological imperative is, uh, is outlandish to them. And so that discussion in terms of coming against feminists is not something that only I've engaged in terms of on Twitter and in public forums, but also in my scientific work, I've had to come across oftentimes people who were very hostile to biology in general and to biology as applied to sex differences. So that's, in, in a sense, that's why I'm particularly, you know, uh, drawn to the discussion dealing with feminism. But in your case, what is it that served as the catalyst for you to go after them? Is it just that you don't like their, their BS and you're, you're looking for truth? Or w what is compelling you to go after them? Well, I always find it entertaining. And as a journalist, we're always sort of ferreting. Uh, our job as journalists is to sort of ferret around the fibs and the PR and the marketing and get to what's actually going on. And it struck me that feminism was a good example of this in action. I always, it was remarkable to me. I mean, it sort of piques my interest when I see people denying obvious facts, you know, in service of a greater good. Whether it's the um, narrative over fact approach to campus rape culture, you know, in Rolling Stone, you know, and all of the all of the fake rape cases that publications either didn't look into closely enough because they didn't want to, or didn't look into close, or did look into closely enough and published anyway. Now that seems to me a subject of something really. Really systemically wrong. It's gone wrong. And as a journalist, you know, I don't. I didn't come to it with a discipline that is sort of butting up against feminist academics in my um, in my work life as you did. But um, I've come to it from the point of view of a journalist who, whose purpose is to is to speak truth to power. And it's very clear that the most powerful social movement, the most powerful political philosophy of our time, is feminism. Now the problem is um, the particular brand of feminism. Um, is is poisonous. The one that, that occupies, you know, the, the seats of power in academia and the media and even in politics is um, is a force for ill in the world, in my view. Now, um, feminism, to be clear, I, I call myself a second wave feminist. I would never identify as a feminist these days because I think the term is ruined as um, all but 7% of British women and 18% of American women now agree uh, who don't identify as feminists because they see what we see, that these people are crazy. Um, <laughs> I would call myself a second wave feminist. You know, I believe in equality of access and opportunity for everyone. I think everyone should have a level playing field, equal education, equal access to the institutions that, that, that surround us and should be rewarded equally for their efforts, their talents and their, and their enthusiasm. Um, that's not what modern feminism believes. Right. And modern feminism has become, I think, um, well, in the words of Christina Hoff Summers, which I, who I think put it best and put it most delicately, a sort of female chauvinism. Um, it now seems to be principally concerned with hating men. It, um, you know, the, the 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 sort of awful sociopathic hashtags that you know kill all white men, and you know I'm drinking male tears. I mean, imagine substituting any other sexual ethnic group into here, uh, and you begin to see just how ugly this stuff is. And it isn't really about um, reasserting, you know, anything on behalf of womanhood. It's just, uh, in my view, it's just about hating men. And in order to do that, I think in order to paint women as some sort of superior um, sex you have to deny basic biological reality right, right. you have to deny all sorts of things actually which are self-evidently obvious to any sensible person and you also have to have a particularly sort of um these days it seems certainly looking at any of the journal any of the feminists in the media and in academia you have to have a you know you have to be a sociopath because to look at the facts as they are out there in the world today 
in the West, let's, let's be specific, and to claim that women are an oppressed class of person in the UK or the US is plainly insane. I mean, it just bears no reality whatsoever. In fact, what much of the data suggests is that the, 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 is that the opposite is true and that men are suffering. And the, fine, just very briefly, I'll try and wrap up. Sure. Sure. Um, the, the, the final thing that I, I really strongly object to, well, not the final thing, another thing I, I hate about feminism is it is profoundly anti-intellectual, as I suggested earlier, but also it, is, it has a loathing for free speech. Right. It has a loathing for open, um, honest debate. It is a, like the scientists I, I dislike, um, or the popularizers of science I dislike, it is a smug, um, you know, sociopathic creed of dead dogma. So to, to, to go ahead, go ahead. To, finish your point. Yeah. No, 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 I'm done. I'm done. I'll be going forever. Otherwise. <laughs> so two two things I want to say. First, uh, I don't know if you if you saw. I put up a YouTube clip a while ago uh, where I was uh, summarizing some findings on sex differences and educational attainment in the United States. And so what uh, this data looks at is four levels of university degrees, what uh, the US calls associate degrees, which is the equivalent of about half a bachelor's. Uh, so associate degree, bachelor's degree, master's, and doctorate. So four, four levels of degrees. And then across five racial groups. So you basically had 20 cells, four levels of education by yep. five races, to, yep. to look at within each of these cells, uh, which of the two sexes was being granted the greater number of degrees. Guess out of the 20 cells, how many men were greater than women? Any? Zero, exactly. None. And so, so I, I facetiously said that yes, there is rampant sexism and American universities. Of course, people would click on that thinking that it would be the usual narrative. It's the exact opposite. Yeah, it's like, actually, no. It's the, um, now, the other thing I was going to mention is that I recently had three very, very unpleasant exchanges with the types of folks that you're, you're describing, two of whom were, uh, I don't know what it is about Forbes journalists, they're drinking something in the water, but these were two Forbes women whom I had interacted with very briefly on Twitter and it very, very, and I mean, truly politely, I mean, it wasn't at all, you know, it, it didn't have any sting, it didn't have, and the, the mere fact that they were being questioned turned into cyber bullying and then, oh, the, yeah, yeah, the, yeah, yeah. right? And it's, that, it's an amazing thing they do. Sorry, you finish first. Yeah, hold, hold on. So, that, and then, uh, now, of course, what I did is a strategy that I saw that you, you do in your own way, which is in your case, you, you, you call on your sexual orientation to protect you from your from from Not, what an allegation <laughs> what an allegation <laughs> in my case i call upon uh, I, i'm from lebanon brown okay. man i'm jewish yep. i am yep. overweight and so okay. i tack on got all of the there. you've got a good oppression package there. <laughs> i've got right. a good oppression package and so they literally are afraid to engage me because they don't so then i start saying things like look at this white privileged woman attacking the fat brown man and yep. boom they disappear so actually <laughs> they don't debate me on the content we literally have an oppressions olympic context contest yep. i win they go away but the other point, I want, the other one i want to mention was this woman put up uh she had you can go check out her 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 site, uh, is, she's a woman who's trying to set up this new law in the United States called Rape by Fraud. Are you familiar with this idea? Oh my God. Yeah, no, no, but okay. I can see where this is going. Okay, so, so, and I actually put up a clip and she came after me saying that I was defaming her. So criticizing a public idea was libel. So basically she's, she, she argued that when men and women are interacting with one another, if a man in the service of trying to bed a woman uh, yeah. is duplicitous to her and yes. then beds her. Misrepresents that, misrep his net worth or something. Yeah. Whatever, right? Uh, yeah. Then that is rape by fraud that should be punishable by up to 20 years in prison. So yeah, I think they're insane. So I, I mean, a, I did, the, 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 go on. I'm sorry, go I did a YouTube clip where I sort of, you know, without trying to even mention her, I mean, I had to, to, to point to her website because I have to demonstrate the, the actual reference. Uh, yeah. But I said, you know, how crazy is it? Because I mean, you know, 90% of online daters, both men and women would be in prison for rape. 
because women will lie about their age, about their looks, about their right. weight, about this. Guys will Any lie. Any woman in a push-up bra. Exactly. About the, <laughs> the guy lies about his height, his income, his ambition. Uh, so, I mean, everybody is a rapist. But, of course, she came after me and said, you're going to hear from my lawyer because you're defaming me. Uh, so it's lunacy. So, I mean, the two, the two things there that you mentioned that I'll pick up on. One is the, the supremacy of identity politics over any sort of substantive argument. The idea that your worth in debate and worse than that, the quality of your ideas is determined by your skin color. I find that so fundamentally abhorrent. Like that's genuinely offensive. Right. That is that is actually offensive. That offends my, you know, my intellect. It offends my sense of fairness. It offends everything. Like that's genuinely offensive. You know, the fact that I you know that the quality of my ideas and my work um, that you know would be judge would be would be um, you know dismissed or unduly promoted either of the two according to my skin color my sexuality or my gender insane um, the other thing is you I mean I don't want to cast aspersions on this woman in particular so we'll t we'll speak about this in general terms sure, but sure. very often I've noticed with um, these sort of particularly batty social justice warriors. And I've reported on some of these in the past. Uh, you know, people, the, the, the Shanley Keynes of this world, who's a prominent Silicon Valley feminist, the Randy Harpers, who, you know, is responsible for appalling abuses and yet sets herself up as a sort of anti-harassment champion. There's this incredible cognitive dissonance they have going on. Very often you'll discover deep dysfunction in their private lives. And my, my supposition, my, my guess is that very often the business of engaging in social justice, of bullying other people, of, of the, engaging in oppression Olympics, is quite often a sort of, um, it's a sort of, of therapy right. for people right. who are um, suffering. It is a, it's, a, it's a sort of learned response to trauma. Because after a while you realise that so many of the ringleaders in this incredibly, you know, off-the-wall movement have such checkered, dark, you know, ugly pasts of, of what, lies, how do, you, how do you get access to that information? Well, very often you see, of course, because they're attention seekers and because they're put, they, you know, they they are desperate for affirmation and to play and to and for victimhood bucks, you know, for the, for the they want currency victimhood. Most of the time, they publish this stuff about themselves. Uh, I've only I've only ever written this stuff according, to, you know, I've, the Randy Harper thing. Everybody, everything I've ever written about Randy Harper is stuff she published on the internet about herself, and then later tried to cover over when it didn't fit her latest sort of um, twist and turn, and you know, in, in her in her sort of endless quest to be accepted by someone, anyone, you know. Um, the problem with all of this is I don't I don't feel any animosity toward people who are suffering and looking for a solution, but I do feel a responsibility as a journalist to you know to sort of cut off some of the, these people's influence if I can when they are unduly affecting innocent people. Um, and in the case of you know some of the feminists I was involved in in the Gamergate controversy, or whether it is other other you know, deeply hypocritical, damaged people whose life mission seems to be to make others suffer on the flimsiest of pretexts and with no, you know, and, and with the most insane, absurd arguments, arguments that are making their way up into the highest corridors of power right. in the West, right? right? That's how, that's how worrying this stuff is. You're you know? thinking about it's, Obama with his uh, rape campus. Obama and with the rape stuff or Black Lives Matter, you know, like uh, getting Bernie Sanders off stage and calling a halt to his campaigns, you know, the, the, there's a particular kind of damage in the millennial generation generation that, that, that I don't think we had as gen what am I gen x I guess yeah um you know we didn't have this we had Nirvana Marilyn Manson and you know self-harm and we got it out of our systems but the millennials didn't they didn't get this out of their systems it's the first is what I think is the first fully middle class generation right. who've never really suffered they've never really known damage and so every slight perceived insult becomes a sort of catastrophic trauma that they need to then revisit on the on, on back on the world in the emo you know the emo kids of the 90s who would sit in their rooms and cry and take drugs and cut themselves and listen to Marilyn Manson would would at least get it out of their systems and turn it inward you know and it wouldn't affect other people but the millennials are doing something different they're taking that 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 teen trauma they're dragging it out into their 20s and 30s and visiting it upon the rest of the world and it's 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 because i'm kind of on the cusp of both of those generations i sort of understand the impulses and have a lot of friends in both camps 
and I have to say, I mean, the millennials are just the most broken generation in history. Um, you know, so the way they treat others is just awful. And let me, they, let me add to that. I want to add to that. Mm. Uh, and it's something I think I'm, there, there's a big there's echo, a by the way. Is there, is there something on your end? There's a, oh, there there's is. A, there's a massive echo happening. I can see if I can find a pair of. Companies. I think Should now. Go I'm, I'm going to try to speak. Uh, let's keep going, but maybe if you don't move, because I think you're hitting something. Uh, hold that. Hold okay. that. Hold. All right. All right, guys. We have some uh, dead time. You can get to watch me uh, look at the camera. For those of you who think that I blink a lot, it's because I look at the camera uh, and that hurts my eyes. Oh, here you are. I am. I've come back with a solution. I was trying to explain to people while you were gone, because some, some people write on my comments uh, section that I blink a lot. And the reason that I blink a lot, it's because I have to stare at this damn green dot and it hurts my eyes and I end up blinking a lot. Yeah, me too. I actually have, um, I have lots of different eye conditions and lots of different eye problems. Oh, um, is that right? Yeah, and I find it very difficult to look at one spot. Exactly, so I kind of hurts. I fidget a lot and I look around a lot and everyone thinks I'm on cocaine, but I'm not. I now can I can it's I hope, earlier stage in my life. Can I, I hope I'm, that if you if you're using now the headphones, it shouldn't affect and it's still recording properly, right? I mean, let's hope so. We're going to be fine. We're, We're going, going to be, be fine. fine. All right. Uh, so uh, here's my theory to add to some of the mechanisms that you were talking about in terms of social justice warriors. So there's this uh, psychiatric disorder uh, known at, uh, as uh, Munchausen syndrome. Yeah. Uh, right? Uh, and there's also Munchausen syndrome by proxy. So Munchausen syndrome is where... Uh, I desire so much to gain sympathy and empathy and people to pay attention to me that I feign illness uh, yes. so that then the doctors and my family and my friends can say, oh, poor, poor Linda, poor Linda. Yes. Right? Yes. Uh, and then, of course, by proxy, it's where you take somebody who's in your care, your pet. Yeah, like your child. Your child, you know, yeah. and child you do it to them. Lie. It's these women who lie that their kids have cancer, that kind of thing. Exactly. And so I think maybe for some of these social justice warriors, uh, I mean, look, there is there is an opportunity to, to gain a lot of attention and sympathy if you constantly cry victimhood, right? Yes, you get, absolutely. You, you get the white knights to come to protect you and so on. So I think there's definitely yeah. that element that's taking place also. It's interesting. We seem to have not just started to permit this, but to actively encourage it by prov by allowing victimhood to become a currency. Right. Um, you know, it is victimhood is now social power. Right. If you can lay some claim to victim, you will the, the burden of proof on your statements lowers your social standing and your earning potential increases in the modern sort of online patreon you know fueled economy um, you will get press you will get attention you will have legions of sycophantic adoring um, uh, credulous idiots on the internet lapping up your every word if you can only persuade yourself that you were some kind of victim and it's interesting that you should uh, seek to pathologize it as some kind of uh, a big, big no because and i think you might be right when you look at the language these people use and which which examples of victimhood they reach for so you occasionally see you occasionally see girls sort of wrongly you know falsely claiming to have been raped um now there's absolutely no way that anybody can know how um, common that is. It seems obvious from the number of prominent rape cases that turn out to be frauds, i.e. all of them, uh, that it's a, certainly a problem on American campuses at the moment. But it's impossible to get, you know, there's just no numbers on this. There's no way, no way even to find out what the numbers might be. So let's, let's put that aside and let's consider, you know, the way in which social justice warriors articulate their dissatisfaction with the world and the way that they interrogate um, dissent and disagreement. Well, first of all, they give themselves syndromes and problems. They say that they are um, gender fluid and they give themselves all sorts of um, muddied sexual identities. Right. They constantly talk about being depressed or having trauma or stress. You know, they say that they've been crying and show, the, the shaking and crying language, you know. Um, all of this stuff, you know, can sound very, very much like sort of diagnostic criteria for one of these hysterical um, illnesses. And then if you look at the way that the way that they respond to criticism, they, they like to mischaracterize ridicule and criticism, which are essential and important tools in our you as, know, rhetorical as arsenal. You're attacking. As bullying, yeah. as abuse, harassment, yeah. um, threats, and victimhood. What is that? That's called paranoia and persecution complex, right. you know? So the, the it, I've, it's interesting. I, I kind of have semi-thought it, but never really 
I never really brought it fully out like you just did. Um, I sort of semi-identified the kind of slightly pathological nature of a lot of this behaviour. But I think you're right, and it's. I think it's worrying if we've if we've encouraged. I think we know that people are malleable, and people, you know, want to get. People will get what they can get, you know. And, and if you tell kids that they can get away with something, they'll push it ten percent over that. If you hand people a victimhood script and you tell them that this is the route to riches, to power, to fame, to notoriety, to um, social affirmation, which is you know an important currency. Um, you know, they're going to take it, they're going to use it, they're going to follow the path. And what we've done, what the media has done, I think, over the last five or ten years, is tell people that they have only to claim that they're victims in order to receive... Get, get, on, get on Oprah. Exactly. Right. You know, um, to get on Oprah. And in fact, it goes, when you, when you put it like that, it goes a lot further than yeah. ten years. <laughs> this has been building well, for a generation well, or two. You know, uh, I, again, there's something that I could use from sort of my personal history to combat some of those uh, impulses that these SJWs have. And that is my personal history, right? So for someone who, you know, I, I don't know if you know my story, but we escaped Lebanon the, during the Civil War as Lebanese Jews uh, under, you know, imminent threat of death. My parents then four years later in 1980, we left at the end of 75 in 1980, they had gone back to Lebanon, they were kidnapped and some really bad things happened. And so somebody who's gone through, I mean, what you see in the news every day is stuff that you know I grew up with and I escaped from, right? So it becomes very difficult for the Wellesley uh, ladies to <laughs> cry victimhood when I come in and I say, oh, you wanna talk about victimhood because you don't fit into your pants anymore? Yeah. Uh, here's, here's a story of victimhood. Melody Wellesley, before and, you carry on. The, a... the reason why I mentioned Wellesley, by the way, is because I actually was invited to go there into the, into the hornet's nest to speak about how the thought police regulate the free exchange of ideas and uh you, you, that you, must have gone nicely <laughs> actually it was pretty good because i'm i mean i i think i'm not really one that sends out the cues that you could intimidate me into a fetal position so they were quite you don't you're you're quite an alpha aren't you, you <laughs> well, have, that's, a, that's a little alpha in you i can see it a um, little <laughs> but i wanted to move on to something else another another uh battle that I've been seeing you're having, well, there are two battles. There's the Twitter battle in general against Twitter. Uh, but I thought we would discuss, and I don't know how long you want to spend on this, uh, but it had great comedic value, your ongoing back and forth with Ben Shapiro. How did I you do? I love Ben Shapiro <laughs> so much. For those of you that who don't know, Ben Shapiro is a sort of conservative Jewish guy in, I think, out of Southern California, who maybe became most famous for his... Uh, defense of uh, the second amendment when he went up against uh, pierce morgan uh, and i think he really did hold his own against pierce uh and that's pretty much the extent of what i knew about ben and we had communicated maybe once or twice him and i and then i see on my twitter feed milo and ben going at each other and i sat and i was literally cracking up laughing at both of your retorts i mean you were both on <laughs> So what is going on there? What happened? Tell me. We tell us about the feud. We love each other. Um, and are you being uh, serious now? Like, do you? Generally... Yes, 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 yes. So okay. I have to, lots of people ask me this, okay. and it is we're DMing each other, saying this is great, isn't it? Um, at the same time as we're hurling like very invective at each other, but it's. I think you can see that we do it with love. Yes. It's in a very uh, you know he he'll take them pick Mickey out of me for being a you know promiscuous homosexual and I'll take the mickey out of him for being short and having like very old readership you know and I'll say I'll say, I'll say, I'll say the difference you don't know the difference between me and Ben Shapiro you know my readers will still be alive in five years you know? <laughs> like all this kind of right. stuff and uh, and he'll say something like what's you know what's the you know, what's the <laughs> What if uh, what has Miley Yiannopoulos got in common with a chocolate fountain? Like everybody gets a taste, you know. Um, whatever. Anyway, so <laughs> um, we have a very fun, uh, lively kind of um, professional rivalry. But what and started I, it? How did it? How did? I mean, you don't. I seem don't know. To be I running think in the same is, circle. Um, well, we're both we're both um, <coughs> uh, we're probably the two best known writers for Breitbart News. Oh, so we have that in common, and we we kind of know each other from that. We've been on stage once or twice before. Um, and uh, obviously, my profile. We, I mean, I think we're both self-confident people. We're both, uh, no, you know, no. but yeah, um, really. Uh, we're we're both um, we're both, you know, like have a have a. I want to say, I don't want to call him. Um, 
I'm certainly arrogant and egotistical and self-important and self-involved. I wouldn't call it Ben any of those things, but he's, he has a has a a an appropriate pride for his professional accomplishments, you know. So obviously, my profile in America has r- risen very quickly, and Ben is always used to having been the wunderkind. You know, he's the one who was like playing the violin at age twelve for you know the ambassador of whatever. You know, he was always like the the amazing kind of prodigy, and then sort of coming up, bringing up the rear. As he might put it, um, it you know, is this is this sort of upstart Brit who's suddenly kind of like catching him up in Twitter followers and readership and all the rest of it. So we have a, a very affectionate, healthy sparring between the two of us. I have overtaken him in Twitter followers, um, <laughs> a, very, a very healthy, lovely, affectionate sparring, um, which sort of flares up once in a while. And once in a while, we'll just be sitting there for two hours, just sort of uh, uh, throwing quips. You know what I like about it, and I. As you know, I hate to flatter myself, but yes. um, obviously, beyond what's obviously unavoidable. Um, what I like about it is you very rarely see these days kind of um, affectionate rivalries yeah. between prominent writers that are played out in, in letters. You know, um, I think in, in up until maybe 20, 30 years ago, there was a good sort of healthy tradition of... Um, writers and thinkers and media figures and academics and sort of corresponding and having um you know interesting relation public relationships you know yeah and one of the, my favorite things to do is read sort of collected letters between you know great whether it's great poets or journalists or whatever the great sort of literary and uh, political and journalistic rivalries of history are very interesting and we don't really have anything like that and i haven't i don't know of anything truly interesting in that bracket you know, in that sort of genre, as it were, uh, in the last sort of 10, 20 years. And I think Ben and I, I hope, I hope people enjoy what we do because I, I, like, I like to imagine that we're recapturing well, what some I of that liked spirit. To, what I've I liked heard. about it is that while you were trading insults, I think one could read the under sort of lying <laughs> friendliness, actually, right? And I think that's the difference between sort of goading one, one another but you know that deep down, I mean, as you correctly said, I mean, and I think I picked that up, that there's there seemed to be some affection there, like, right? N- neither of you were getting upset. Whereas, you know, very, very rarely, I mean, I would say 99% of the time, you know, all of my exchanges with folks are always positive. But on the few occasions where somebody breaks a social violation, is disrespectful yeah. in a way that really annoys me, uh, yeah. then even though to you it might sound like it was little, if I find it very disrespectful, I will respond harshly. And, yeah. and and in seeing you two guys, you know, spar with one another, I didn't pick up any of that disrespect. Or... But you don't know, and I don't think there is any, because we, we have a profound respect for each other's different methods, you know? And it's one of the things that's good about, the not to make it too sort of left versus right, because that can get very boring very quickly, but I, I, I think there is a general um, humorlessness and earnestness on the political left that, you know, it, it feeds into their language policing and their pronoun, like, um, Z Z. Oh God! I mean, it's it's this this it's, it's that's that really is a pathology. You know, there's sort of it's this obsession with pronouns. All, yeah. all of that sort of um, the authoritarian instinct of the left, um, and it's not unique to the left. The religious right were just as bad in their own way, right. but were you know now today it's the left doing it. And I think there's a better tradition, although I think this is true in all periods of history. Frankly, there's a better tradition of mischief and fun and irreverence and ridicule on the sort of libertarian dissident right, right. you know, whether it's Buckley or whatever, you know, yes. um, that, that sort of um, mischief and naughtiness, which is very much how you I know, see myself, you know who is raised- seeing that played that played out is, is nice. And Shapiro and I, I enjoy that with one another. So yeah, it's, it's a fun thing for me. I don't know if you know, do you know who Bill Whittle is? Do I hear Bill Whistle? Bill Whistle. I, said, I feel like I recognize the name, but my my knowledge of American he, figures is something. So he's in. Possible. He's in. Uh, I mean, he 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 releases a lot of his stuff through PJ uh, Media. Uh, oh, I've I, seen the byline. I think. Uh, yeah. he, I think he's got a series called Afterburner, and I think in one of the clips he actually talks about the fact that contrary, sort of, to popular, uh, you know, folk wisdom, uh, cons- so-called conservatives are actually, I mean, to use his words, more fun than sort of the, the typical... Well, we're so method. much more fun, mostly because we're better educated, you know, so we've got more things to draw on. Okay. We've Please got direct things. all hate mail to my law. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, look, we've got, we're better looking, we've got more money, and we're better educated, so of course we're more fun. Here come I the mean, generalizations, go. No, 
<laughs> I'm just saying, you know, it just if you it stands to reason if you've got less to worry about, you're gonna, uh, in, you know, you're gonna develop the higher pleasures: right. literature, music, art, philosophy, humor. You know, I mean, it, 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 it's, it's very obvious to me why conservatives would be naturally funnier than liberals. I'm gonna talk in a second about one group. That to who that you direct some generalizations at. So hold off for a second. I'm, uh, I'm happy to defend myself. <laughs> <laughs> let's uh, let's talk about. I, I wanted to pass by you an idea that I'm actually. This is I think the first time that I talk about this uh, publicly. Uh, one of my graduate students and I are uh, looking at studying something that is at least relevant to your sort of personal history. Uh, we're looking at exploring the intersection between evolutionary psychology and consumer behavior, which is what I do, but specifically within the homosexual market. And so you might say, well, how, what, what, how do these things kind of relate? So one of the things that we're thinking of doing, uh, and I just wanted to sort of get your first sort of yeah, layman yeah, yeah. reaction to it. So if you look at, uh, say, the classic, you know, top-bottom dichotomy, right, in, in, in sexual... Mm -hmm. uh, relationships amongst what men. What are you about to ask me? I'm feeling... I'm feeling no, 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 hold on, hold on. <laughs> uh, so, for example, there is there is a scientific study, and I actually wrote an article about it in on my Psychology Today blog, looking at... Uh, so, of course, there are the versatiles, but then there are the heavily top, the heavily bottoms. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, 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 and it turns out that, you know what was correlated to whether they were high, you know, highly top or bottom in this particular study? Can you, can you think of anything? Uh, in terms of spending habits... Uh, no, it, no. This is not. This is not about consumer behavior. This is unrelated. Oh, but what, what are you? Uh, what what sort of thing? So it was actually penis size. Uh, oh, so if they're bigger, they might be tops. Exactly. So, yeah, I mean that stands to reason, right? Yeah, right. So anyway, so so what we thought is to take this idea of top versus bottom, yes. and see whether if you identify yourself as predominantly being bottom or top, and now yes. you're in a gay couple. Will yes. some of the dynamics that happen in heterosexual coupling, for example, you go out on a date yes. and, uh, you know, uh, typically in terms of that courtship ritual, the man will pick up the tab. It doesn't matter how oh, much. Right? You're so, absolutely right about this. You are more right than you oh, realize. Oh, beautiful. Many, is that a many, science paper right there? Yes, it is. And I'll tell you, I'll tell you, I'll give you some interesting insight here. And um, nobody better steal that idea because we haven't published it yet. Right. If you're watching, you can't have it. Exactly. I might write a column about it, but not until he's done his paper. Okay. So. Watch out. Sure. Uh, my hunch on this, based on my experience, is that um, the penis size thing is definitely true. But also, I um, don't know what it says about me that I'm a, I'm a bottom, but no. <laughs> sorry. Um, hey, maybe you're the outlier. Maybe you're the exception. You don't know. Uh, <laughs> I think I'm pretty average. I don't know. Um, okay. Um, what, um, what I've observed is that at a time when heterosexuals are running away from traditional institutions like marriage and engaging, you know, you've got these stories about men having sex with other men, although they still identify as straight, the gender queer, the trans, all of this kind of um, messiness among gender identities, among heterosexuals, and them giving up on traditional um, relationships, uh, traditional institutions like marriage. Gay communities are going in the opposite direction. The many, many gay relationships I know look like the stereotypical idyllic 1950s relationship where you have the top who goes out and earns the money, who works out, you know, and the bottom who looks after the home and who, you know, and who very often spends the money. There's a lot of gay relationships fall into that um, pattern. And are you applying and this only for uh, male homosexual relationships or you're applying this also for sort of the butch fam I don't believe in lesbians, so I don't really think I don't spend much what do you, time. You don't believe about in lesbians. I don't happening? believe in lesbians. It's just it's just unhappy women between relationships. Oh, I don't. <laughs> no, 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 no. Okay, there are a couple of butch dykes who are like lesbians for life, okay. but all of the women that they have sex with, the pretty ones, are lesbians for a while. I mean, I'm just saying in a slightly blunter way what anybody, you know, anybody. So you're talking about sexual. Flu you're talking about sexual exactly. fluidity. Okay. Women have much more malle malleable, fluid sexualities, and very few, very vanishingly few women. Tiny percentage of percent of a percent of women only excuse me only have sex with women ever you know it just doesn't really happen whereas a perfectly respectable percentage of um, men only have sex with men and most most gay men have only had sex with men most self-identified lesbians have done both and not off, very often equal quantities of both I don't really believe in lesbians I think there's a tiny proportion of like butch bull dykes but there aren't really any lesbians but so the uh, women that that couple together for forty years. What it just means they've given up. 
Oh, come just, on, it, man. Look, no, look, look at lesbian bed death. You know, I've written, written about this. Okay, the two th- the two things that the two reasons you know that these people have basically just given up: lesbian domestic violence, lesbian obesity. Right. The two characteristics of lesbian relationships aren't anything to do with role the roles that they take. Um, actually, there are three. Lesbian domestic violence epidemic. You'll never hear about it. Nobody wants to talk about it. I wrote um, an article very sensitively titled Attack of the Killer Dykes, which was about this. Um, <laughs> well, <laughs> just, I'm, this. I'm getting a headache at the hate mail that's coming my way. Oh my God, I'm <laughs> getting a migraine. You me to behave on this podcast. I'm merely, repeat, I'm merely quoting the title of a piece of journalism, okay? <laughs> right. um, <laughs> I, I called it Attack of the Killer Dykes. It was about lesbian domestic violence. Nobody wants to talk about it. Lesbian bed death. Um, which is a phenomenon that describes the fact that lesbians just don't have sex after the first couple of months, you know? A double-headed dildo gets no action after the first family month of Family show! Family show! Sorry, we can cut that bit out. Um, <laughs> no, okay. uh, and um, oh, what else was it? Anyway, I can't remember. There was a third one. But you know, there's lots of things suggest that um, that these, these sorts of lesbian relationships are actually just women giving up on relationships at all. Um, they're not, they don't really want to have meaningful sec- engaging sexual relationships with another human being at all, so they form a sort of partnership with another woman. Um, and lots of radical feminists will agree with this, by the way. Uh, you, t- you see you sort of, um, you know, second wave, trans- the sort of trans-exclusionary radical feminism, whether it's Jermaine Greer, Julie Bindle or whatever, they'll say, yeah, I just hate men. I just hate men. I'm a lesbian because I hate men. And they're perfectly happy saying that. And we accept it because they're women and because they're lesbians. Whereas, you know, of course, if you, as a, you know, uh, if as a, any other group, then that, that's, that's not acceptable because, of course, you're born gay, which you're not. That's a lie. That's just PR from the gay industry. Um, nobody's born gay. It's stupid. Uh, what a stupid now, are, you, idea. are you being serious now about the last time? I'm you totally serious. It was invented by so the you, gay law. So you think your sexual orientation was a choice? I think it's a mixture. It's a mixture, but I remember making a very conscious decision to bring bring home lots of drug dealers to annoy my mother. Um, you know, I, I remember distinctly that a, a element, a choice component in my sexual identity, very distinctly, very clearly, I remember this. Um, and those people who think they were just born this way don't know better, or they're kidding themselves, or they're just lying. Um, you know, born this way was an invention of the gay lobby in the eighties and nineties to get around the religious right, who used to say that homosexuality was an immoral lifestyle choice. So the gay lobby we were like, oh God, what do we do? Well, I guess, yes, it is, according to your rules. Ah, I know, gay gene. We were born this way. We're just like women. We're in a press club. We're just like women or blacks. We were born this way, so you can't discriminate against us. How about that one, guys? Can I yeah. interject? what happens that's literally what happened I mean everybody knows this is what happens this is what GLAD did this is what all of the gay lobby organisations did in the 80s and 90s and it's sort of stuck there's no scientific basis whatsoever for this and it's obviously a mixture some people buy into the epigenetic kind of hormonal womb thing um, but it's obviously a mixture for everyone and it's perhaps more or less of a mixture for some people but to simply say that gays are born this way at a bare minimum at a bare minimum um there's no scientific basis for such a claim. So I will have to respectfully disagree with the lack of scientific basis. I think both homosexual and sexual orientation is innate. Now, what's interesting about the the gay lobby that you were talking about, and I actually briefly mentioned this in the first chapter of one of my books, The Consuming Instinct, uh, the gay lobby will argue that being gay is you're born, which they're correct and you contest that. Uh, whereas they will argue that heterosexuality is an imposed norm, which is quite an extraordinary statement to make, right? You have a hetero, I mean, you have a sexually reproducing species where somebody is arguing that homosexuality is innate, it's while normal. heterosexuality <laughs> is an it's imposed, an imposed heteronormative, right? So it is, yeah. I mean, you don't really have to be a sophisticated <laughs> evolutionist, right? I hate gay people. This is, you know, what drives more homophobia in America today than any like, than anything else? It is like the gay establishment, not gay people. Nobody cares that much anymore about gay people. It is like... The, it's the little progressive gay lobby that come out with lies and, and nonsense like this. They just make us all sound crazy. I mean, I'm so like, I feel so awkward and angry that I'm represented by these people who just to just say stuff like what you just described. And I'm just like, oh my God, I hope people don't think I think that. Yeah, it's awful. So, but if you go back to your earliest, and then we'll leave this point, but I want to be on record in saying that I disagree That's with you. That's fine. You can but, be wrong on record. That's okay. <laughs> but if, if you go back to your earliest, uh, sexual memory, not of you having sex, but in terms of being attracted to a target, uh, yes. recognizing that you're attracted to Linda or to Bob. 
yes. would you, would you say that your earliest memories were ones where the target of your sexual attraction were boys or or no it was fluid or me, what me it was a mixture it, it was and a mixture I, okay and i picked one you know? okay and what was what was the catalyst of you deciding that uh, despite so the it fact would, that it's it not would annoy the, my mother I just knew it would annoy my mother. I bought him lots of black coffee. So even so, even today, as you couple with other men, you're not doing it because there is some. Well, I think I'm in a rut now. I think it's, I think it's sort of stuck. I tried because you know I'm attracted to things that are, are naughty and transgressive, as you can tell from my journalism. But it all comes really from the fact that I like forbidden sex, and so I like you know sex with scary people and and um, sort of. You know, I like to be quite powerless and all the rest of it. Well, let's, let's let's not move on from that. But oh, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> we let's save this for another day. We'll save this for, for we'll save for, it for offline, offline for hours. But the point I'm making is yes. that now homosexuals are so mollycoddled and right. pandered to, and so endlessly patronised in culture. My sex life has sort of become less interesting because right. I know that in the middle of it, nobody's going to nobody's. You know, my mother's not going to rush in and disapprove. Um, this is why Catholics have the best sex because all sex is somehow you know guilt naughty. Right. Um, yeah, no, it's like, God. People are like, oh, Catholics, you're so screwed up about sex. Yes, that's the point. It's fantastic. Yeah, um, expert, <laughs> do, do you speak French or do you, a little? Do, so there is, you know, sort of the classic stereotype of the very gentle, quiet Catholic girl. And there's an expression in French that says, méfie-toi de l'eau dormante. Beware of still water, right? So yeah. underneath this very oh, sort of... Cool, cool, cool. Yeah. <laughs> so this is, yeah, this is when you go for like nice, um, blonde, peppy, Californian, like preppy rich girls. They're always broken and damaged and they want to do it. And I'll let you put it anyway. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm totally, totally down with that. I'm one of those girls. Um, no, but uh, uh, the, um, the, the, I've sort of, Lost, lost interest in sex slightly now that homosexuals are so endlessly mollycoddled. But I'm only half joking about this. I thought I want, I, you know, I think it might be time. I wrote a column about this, so some people listening will have already heard this joke. But I wrote a column at the time, uh, a while ago, um, you know, because I like transgressive sex, I like naughtiness, and I like, you know, being the forbidden. I'm very drawn to, to the forbidden. Um, was one of those personalities. Um, I think I might have to go and join a new oppressed victimhood class so that my sex is forbidden again. I may have to become a straight white male. It's the only, it's the only thing for it. It's the only is the only group in society that is constantly. That's all that's left. Demonized and ridiculed us, you know, like uh, I would say, our sexual. Your sexual impulses are constantly pathologized and ridiculed. Right. You're called creepy, racist. You know, any straight man who expresses any sort of sexual interest in a woman whatsoever is somehow at fault for something, right. somehow, in some way. I think I should go straight. It's I'm the only actually, way I'm going to get an erection again. <laughs> speak. I, mean, I want to get to the next topic, but uh, I, I, I've remarked about this. Uh, point uh, in some form I can't remember where uh, so for example if you look at uh, being unattracted to say heavy women right yeah uh, so then that you, typically you'll be accused of being a fattest right I mean you're 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 denying an opportunity of love and meaningfulness with a woman simply because of your disgusting norm of having learned that you know Beyonce is more attractive than somebody who weighs 800 pounds now, the opposite also holds true. If you are somebody who particularly is attracted to, say, women who are very heavy, you know what they will then argue, those women? They will fetishizing them. Exactly. Yes, so yes. so I it's perfect, so right? So no, it's, if it's you great. say... I, happens, I, you're still wrong. Right. All states of the world <laughs> lead to oppression. If I don't <laughs> like you because you're overweight, I'm a pig. If I like you because you're overweight... I'm a pig. There is no way I can't be a pig. <laughs> so I, um, I kind of, um, I have a fairly social justice proof personality because I'm gay and I don't mind telling you about it and because I like black guys. And all the you can't really get me on racism. You can't because my dating history looks like do a I, Do I at all pass for the brown skin or that's way too light? Oh, I could, I could, I don't know, a couple it's of drinks. Okay. You could be there. Uh, okay. could be there. <laughs> I have a daddy thing. You could totally go there. All right. All right. Fair enough. I um because I like black guys and because you know I'm gay and yada yada yada. They can't really get me on sexism. They can't really get me on homophobia. They can't get me on racism, which are their primary avenues. When they don't like what you're saying, they will seek to delegitimize you by attacking you rather than the argument, sure. as we discussed earlier in the conversation. So now they've come up with this new thing I've noticed, and they said, um, 
Well, you you know, you might never stop banging on about your, you know, sexual desires for darker skin, but of course all you're really doing is fetishizing the black experience and like, oh god. Oh god. So, so it is racism. You are being racist. No, it's no, so in fact you're the worst kind of racist. Right. You are dehumanizing and oh my god. Oh my god. You know, and I just here's the thing about whether it's crazy video game critic feminists or whether it's Black Lives Matter or whether it's any one of these other sort of loony gender warriors or you know, grievance mongers, race hucksters, whoever it is. It, the reason they're losing in 2016 is going to be the great glorious year of, of you know, popular revolution against social justice, and it's already happening. Um, the reason they're losing is they've excluded more people than they've included by gradually calling everyone a name at some point. Because when you set the bar, what happens is when you set the bar so unrealistically and absurdly high that no one can make the grade, or, or that only 2% or 1% or 0.2% of the population can ever meet your standards, the majority will say, well, your, your standards are unattainable, so I'm just going to stop bothering. I'm just not going to bother trying. And what do they do when they're constantly told by, let's say, Democrat politicians that they're racist, sexist, that they are benefits of white, cishet, you know, male, patriarchal, blah, blah, blah. They say, you know what? I know I'm not a racist. I know I'm not a sexist. Screw you guys. I'm voting for Trump. You know, and that's that's the product. You know, Trump and to a certain extent, me too. You know, we are the product of, in very different ways, we're very different figures. And I don't want to sort of say that we're identical in any way, but um, kind of are a little bit in some some respects. Uh, and we are most in, mostly because we are direct products of the progressive left. And I've got a naturally contrarian personality. If I was living under a great sort of um, religious dictatorship, I'd probably be left wing because I... I because I believe more than any political position in free speech right. and in, um, you know, I'm, what is it? I'm Ian, uh, whatever. I'm like the contrarian personality, you know, the debater. I love exposing people to different points of view and challenging them, making them think. As it happens, I'm on the right side of history because uh, the, the incumbent power is the one that's got. Oh, what happened? Oh, I don't know. Give me a second. Sorry. All right. Sorry, guys. Um, okay, here we go. He's back. He's back. Two, two terrible interruptions. I'm sorry. I'm the no worst worries. behaved guest that he's ever going to have. Um, so people in and out my house all the time. Um, what um, you you were what linking, I think you were linking. Yeah, no, what, I, what I love is what I love is free speech and free intellectual inquiry and open exchange of ideas and provoking humorless, earnest people who can't take jokes yeah. and who want to stop you from reading certain things and thinking about certain things i love all of that you know and basically um i just find it sorry well there there is i think an a rev sort of a, a a a breath of fresh air irreverence about you that at least when i sort of first found out about you you know made me desirous to 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 have a chat with you because uh i respect people who don't succumb to all of these different forms of thought policing, right? I, I put out a tweet recently where I said, uh, you know, I was I was remarking about the fact that, you know, in Hollywood there are so few people who are not sort of part of the, what would be called the regressive left and all those sort of progressives. And I mentioned Clint Eastwood. I mean, I sort of thought of the first guys that came to mind. So Clint Eastwood, James Woods, uh, yeah. Rosanna Barr. I mean, she's, she's no Einstein. Rosanna Barr's great, isn't uh, she? And then there was a fourth one. I can't remember who the fourth one was. And, and then people started, be in there. yeah, yeah uh, and people started getting angry because, oh, what you, why you support this? My point was that they, oh, it was John Voight, actually, the, the, the oh, yeah, I love him, the, the love, father you know, of I... Angel, Angelina Jolie. And, and my point was that they had, all four of them had the testicular fortitude to simply stand up. Very sexist, uh, uh metaphor. Sorry, sorry, okay, so the, the, <laughs> the, the, the ovarian fortitude. Uh, to, <laughs> Who ever heard of such? No, let's right. take the testicular. Uh, so, you know, my point was not that, you know, I've, I've analyzed everything that Roseanne Barr said and I agree with it or disagree with it. It's simply the fact that she had the courage to speak out. And, and when, you know, you, when you're in academia, for example, uh, you know, everybody is a sheep, right? Uh, yeah. And you have to act like a sheep. And precisely in the environment where you're supposed to be an open thinker and think outside the box. Yeah. And, and so, so I was remarking about their courage and yet people got upset because suddenly I was a supporter of Rosanna Barr. Frankly, I don't really know her positions. Uh, but I want to get to the 
possibly the last topic, although, of course, I could keep you here for another six hours. I want to read to you. Having so much fun. We should just keep it going forever. Thank you so much. Can I tell you what is actually the only thing that stops me from going on forever? It takes me. I might say dildo again. No. Uh, (laughs) I'm willing to to bear that risk uh, to go on. It's that it takes me forever to upload these damn things. Oh, yeah, it does take a while. Now, yeah. I don't know if it's... Been... We have many, many years ahead of many fruitful uh, you. you're, you're, discussions on other subjects. You're so lovely. Don't worry. You're don't lovely. Worry. I'm going to read you some really boring, idiotic, unaccomplished guys. Don't say who they are. And then let's okay. see if we can identify any common threads about them. Okay. Uh, here I've got a list of 54 of them. I won't read all 54, but I'll read a few that might tickle your fancy. So okay. Niels Bohr, Francis Crick, James Watson... These are the co-discoverers of the double helix structure mm-hmm. of DNA. Mm-hmm. Richard Feynman, Linus Pauling, Pavlov, N- John Nash, that's the, uh, the guy who uh, Russell, uh, Russell Crowe played him, uh, the economist. In mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, yeah, right? of course, yeah. Uh, of course, yeah. Let me now skip a bit. Here are some other folks. Stephen Hawking, as you mentioned. Sigmund Freud, Alfred Kinsey, Yes. Uh, Steve Wozniak, the co-founder of Apple. Alan Turing, whom I'm sure you know who that is. Uh, I do. Not because he's he was gay and you're gay. Yeah, but because, just because we all because know he's Br- yeah, yeah. Because he's British and famous <laughs> guy. B.F. Yeah, yeah, Skinner, yeah. right? Skinnerian conditioning. Let me mention a few more. Albert Camus, Marquis de Sade, as somebody who loves some of the kind of stuff. I, I, Stephen Fry, Franz Kafka, Salman Rushdie, George Bernard Shaw, a few more. Bertrand Russell. Simone de Beauvoir, Karl Marx, Nietzsche, John Stuart Mill, Jean-Paul Sartre, Schopenhauer, and Spencer. Some real idiots, some real morons, some real schmucks, (laughs) some real poorly dressed folks. Do you know what they have in common? You're going to tell me they were all atheists. Bingo! (laughs) What a bunch of retards. What a bunch of morons, these 54 Nobel laureates. (laughs) <laughs> Please explain to us why why all these morons oh, are utterly God. wrong. I thought we were going to end this on a high. I am not going. We're not going to sort of like <laughs> argue through the god delusion. No, no. Uh, I, frankly, I don't even. I mean, you could give me an answer, but I just wanted to jokingly. No. I know. To you that, I know. Yeah. <laughs> Look, I don't. I don't necessarily think atheists are stupid. I just think they're wrong, I and I don't. Um, and what I find entertaining about them very often is how thin-skinned they are. And you know, in the court, in, and you've demonstrated it for me beautifully uh, in this conversation by answering, asking me, you know, perfectly friendly, interesting, um, you know, loose questions for the rest of it, but preparing a huge litany of examples for the oh, last. Oh no! So question. I'm one of those the thin-skinned one that, the atheists. The one that obviously got to you, the one you really wanted to nail me on, so you put your, you did your homework, was the atheism question, which sort of demonstrates my point. Okay. My point being that very often atheists do suffer from a sort of extraordinary thin-skinned um, uh, uh, sort of protection, you know, sort of feeling of, of, of anxiety about their lack of belief. You know? And I, I think maybe it's got something to do with... Um... Uh-oh. <laughs> Uh-oh. Well, I sort of think that atheism is kind of a symptom of autism. Um, you know, if you can't really relate to other human beings very well, you could be really smart and you can have all the logical stuff worked out and that's fine. Um, but if you're, but you can't really relate to other human beings, you don't, maybe it's a sort of sociopathy autism spectrum. How can you ever come to know, you know, sort of make, make those intuitive faith-based love-based leaps of logic that it required for religion? Um, and understand God's love if you can't understand the love between other, you know, between other human beings. If you don't really get other people, how could you possibly get, you know, how could you fathom an intelligence that created the universe? Um, I, you know, and the, the the coincidence of autism and atheism is is incredibly high. By the way, they're basically codependent. You're you know. just making this stuff up now. No, just, I'm not. <laughs> you can know there's a study, and I'm going to send it to you. Please do. And it shows, and it, it it's like a locked on. It's only a correlation, but it's locked on tight. You know, like atheism and autism is like you know they go hand in hand. Now, I'm not saying that one causes the other necessarily. I'm suggesting as a as a as a perhaps a. a Point of discussion that certain kinds of mind might be disposed towards. So I'm basically I'm a sufferer of Asperger's syndrome. Basically, 
and I'm a, as I'm a high as, functioning autistic guy, high functioning <laughs> autist, and as a result, you've you've ended up deciding there's no god. <laughs> <laughs> very very nice way to end today's conversation. Anything... I thought we were going to end on a high note. I, I didn't realize we were going to take it there, but uh, you did. You did. I have to confess, in, in to to give you credit, um, you in your list of of. Um, idiots and schmucks you did read out several of my heroes so um, that's why you know, I, I chose them by the I way I know you did this, this, this autistic like, guy this <laughs> autistic guy has Machiavellian intelligence it turns out yeah uh, yeah well he was, he was an autistic atheist as well um, <laughs> I'm actually probably not I don't know I can't remember um, no I know exactly what you were doing um, no I mean many of them many of them wonderful brilliant incredible people um, many of them found gods later in life by the way or at least something to appropriate something to, to approximate and there are plenty of great scientists who believe in God and plenty of great mathematicians who come to be Christians um, the further they get into their careers so look I mean let's not play statistics with that obviously um, I think it's perfectly possible to be a brilliant highly intelligent articulate and logical person and arrive at a logical you know arrive in a logical way to to as much as you can of faith and still decide that you want to take that leap and still believe in it. And I think it's also one thing that might interest you in the context of what we've been talking about is one of the things the progressive left does very often. They say, well, you're gay. How can you be a Catholic? Because they require this sort of pathetic, childish consistency that they don't demand of themselves when they're talking about their sort of gender fluidity or whatever, you know, but they'll demand it from you. And it profoundly misunderstands what the church is or Christianity is and homosexuality to say these things are, you know, completely incompatible and also ignores the simple fact that we all, as Eliot put it, contain multitudes and we are all messy and complex and we all have competing um, beliefs, um, you know, atheists um, may, have, may have decided and may be happy that they've decided, they've resolved, you know, a particular conflict in their mind. But many of the other things they believe will be based just as on faith as, you know, the religion that they criticize. Um, I think we can agree, at least, that um, that we are all messy and complicated. And um, n none of us has the right to demand of another person that their interior lives is completely internally consistent according to your own uh, belief system. What we can do, I think, is interrogate arguments. And what I think social I think that what social justice is so the reason it's so poisonous is that it draws attention back to the individual as a means to delegitimize um, an argument or a belief system or a point of view. When what I think uh, my belief is that we should we should approach and deconstruct and analyze arguments on their own terms, you know, on their own merits. Maybe next time we'll talk about uh, whether it is possible to be moral. Uh, while being, while whilst being an atheist. Now, of course, I'm willing to bet that you think that without morality, we would all be running, decapitating puppies, and then raping them. I, just, so, I think you could be. I think you could be an atheist and sort of be accidentally moral. You know. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I'm only accidentally not going on on raping pillages right now. Because yeah, otherwise, I, without it's, some it's celestial your, guy. It's, Cultural inheritance, you know, all of your values have been shaped by the society in which you live, which is Judeo-Christian. And the fact that you're an atheist doesn't mean that you can cast off all of that socialization and all of, of course, of your natural evolutionary instincts, which tell you that certain things aren't going to be in your best interests. Um, so, but yeah, I mean, atheists can be accidentally moral, sure. <laughs> to be continued, <laughs> is there anything that I need to put, I mean, not that you're not notorious enough that you need my promotion but uh is there anything that you'd like me a project that you're working on that you'd like me to include in the people descriptor can, uh, people can follow me um for as long as i'm still allowed to have a twitter account oh, uh yes. at uh, twitter.com slash nero like the emperor who is awesome aside from the christian burning and uh <laughs> other than that my columns are at breitbart and um it's been a pleasure thank you so absolute much absolute pleasure i'm gonna stop it but stay on the line thank you so much Mara. Sure. this is really amazing thank you All right.